Welcome to the first in our series of bi-monthly seminars, where we look at the impact of supercomputing and the importance of community in specific scientific domains. Today's focus is computational fluid dynamics, or CFD. My name is Ann Buckhouse, and I'm the Education and Training Manager at the POSI Supercomputing Center in Perth, Western Australia. Before we get started, uh, formally, I'd like to acknowledge the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation, the traditional custodians of the land on which we're broadcasting, as well as the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia. We pay respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples joining us today. Today's session starts with an introduction of our topic, followed by panelist discussion. We'll have a short break, a second poll, and then we'll open the floor to your questions to the panelists. As we're going, feel free to enter questions into the Zoom chat. As many of you know, the POSI Supercomputing Center is one of Australia's two tier one supercomputing centers, the other being NCI in Canberra. Last month, POSI announced that HPE would be the vendor delivering our new supercomputer and we're pretty excited about what's coming. The new supercomputer will deliver up to 50 petaflops or 30 times more compute power than our current systems, Magnus and Galaxy. So what are the new possibilities and challenges being brought about by next generation supercomputers and exascale in context of CFD? That's what we're here today to discuss. We'll look at two foundational questions. What does it mean to scale? And what does it take to scale? And importantly, once we open this discussion, where can we continue our dialogue on it? We've brought together several leading researchers from diverse fields working in computational fluid dynamics. I'll be briefly introduce them now, and you'll hear more about their research throughout this session. And then maybe you can give a wave as I introduce you. Um, so Professor Richard Sandberg is the Chair of Computational Mechanics in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Melbourne. His main interest is in high fidelity simulation of turbulent flows and the associated noise generation in industrial relevant applications, mostly related to generation and transport. He's been granted an Australian Research Council Future Fellowship for 2020 to 2023. Next, Dr. Christopher Lenardi is a senior lecturer in the School of Mechanical and Mining Engineering at the University of Queensland, an advanced Queensland industry research fellow. Chris's research is currently targeted at the development of large scale numerical models, which can be used to provide insight into the complex characteristics of fluid solid interaction in oil and gas reservoirs. Much of this work is undertaken in close collaboration with industry via the UQ Center for Natural Gas. And there are three individuals joining us from POSI. Dr. Maciej Saitowski is the head of scientific services for the POSI Supercomputing Center. Maciej is a mathematician and computational scientist and has expertise in optimization and development of applications on massively parallel and accelerated HPC systems. Basha Mehaboob has a PhD in mechanical engineering from UTM Malaysia and extensive experience in parallel algorithms and numerical methods related to computational fluid dynamics, multi-flow, sorry, multi-phase flow and heat transfer. He's worked with several modeling and simulation software applications and has published more than 40 journal and conference papers in his research area. And last but not least, our Chief Technology Officer, Ugo Veretti, Veretto, who has a wealth of international expertise, including computational science and research, supporting complex distributed software solutions, software engineering and development, architecture and testing. His focus is particularly on data intensive, 
high performance computing and interactive distributed visualization solutions. I could go on, but we'll let you hear about the research in their own words as we go forward in this discussion. Today, POSI provides expertise and in infrastructure in supercomputing, cloud services, data intensive analysis, stored storage and visualization to more than 1,600 researchers. Last year, among almost 200 projects that POSI Supercomputer supported, Magnus uptake for engineering projects accounted for about 39% of its use. This number doubles the next largest allocations, which were physics and chemistry with almost 17% each. The CFD research being done at POSI is diverse including fluid dynamic studies and engineering applications like turbulent flows in pipes and turbo machinery, and in health applications like flow in veins and hearts. Other areas include environmental and climate applications, oceanography, ocean engineering, aerodynamics, fluid structure interaction, multi-phase flows, oil, gas, oil and gas applications, and many more. Richard. You're working on turbulent flows and have been using POSI for many years, as well as several supercomputers around the world. During a recent interview for one of our case studies, you mentioned that last year alone, you used over 400 million core hours. Now to put that in context, that is four times the entire allocation POSI currently contributes to NCMAS. Can you tell us about your research when did you turn to supercomputers and how has that impacted your outcomes? Okay, thanks Anne for the introduction and also for having me. Um, well, 400 million hours is a lot. In industry to improve uh, different types of um, machines and, and products. Um, so I, I've always been interested in high fidelity simulation because that's the only way really to elucidate physical um, mechanisms. But um, part of the thing we're really trying is to take this uh, into configurations that are industrially relevant as well. So it, we, we do need to look at more complexity. We do need to look at uh, say more complex um, operating conditions. Um, the, the way we do this is, is obviously um, solving the Navier-Stokes equations um, that, that are governing kind of fluid flow. And we do this in, in a compressible form because we're actually looking at um, flows that are present, say, in gas turbines. And uh, I, I kind of like the area of looking at energy and gas turbines because, you know, even very small efficiency gains can have vast economic and also environmental effects um, or impacts. So um, we need accuracy um, from the simulations to, to actually get additional understanding and help um, you know, improve efficiencies of some of these um, machines. And just, just as an example, I mean, I've got this picture. Behind, um, yeah. And um, ju just that you face your mentally, for example, and we can simulate this. Um, and in some of the simulations we've conducted, we, we found that, um, that the spacing between these blades does play a big role in the overall efficiency. Um, so you can get something like 0.2 or 0.3% efficiency gains um, if you actually have the correct spacing of these blades. And that doesn't sound like a lot, um, but if we kind of think of um, global aviation burning, you know, 360 billion liters of fuel per year. Um, if you multiply that by, uh, you know, a fraction of a percent, even that is a very big number. Um, so, so accuracy matters a lot, and this is why we we are very keen on running high fidelity simulations. And high fidelity means we have to resolve a lot of the scales that are present in in the flow. So we need very big grids, big domains, um, and we need big computers to do that. Um, so I, I started um, looking into uh, high performance computing and uh, writing code about 
20 years ago. Um, and the code we're currently using, we started writing about 15 years ago. So it's been a, an evolution over a long time. Um, one of the things I always wanted was a code that has a very low um, memory footprint, simply because a lot of the machines we have been using uh, are bandwidth limited. Um, so we're, we're trying to minimize the uh, memory required. Um, and that's been very, very good ever since we, we started that. Uh, so, so it's been the same. We had, had benefits on moving towards GPUs as well, um, you know, having that kind of architecture of the code. Um, so it's not an all purpose code, but it's the code that is very highly optimized to do the problems we're interested in. Um, and, and we get, um, you know, pretty good speed ups versus general codes, general purpose codes that um, we would have to use otherwise. Um, so, um, so yeah, I, I think that's it from me for now. So one quick thought, I was muted. If everybody else also could mute themselves. Um, there was a little bit of, of interference with some of your presentation, but we, we, we caught most of it, Richard. Okay. Um, the, the, the use of your code. So at what point did you think we need to start developing our own codes? And what, what was that kind of decision moment? Well, it was in, in about 2005, I think, and, and we were moving to a new machine. I was still in the UK at the time, and we were moving to a new machine. It was a distributed memory machine, so we, we needed to kind of move to MPI anyway. Um, everything I'd done before was, was shared memory. We used OMP for parallelization. Um, so we, we needed a new code anyway. Um, and I was keen on moving towards um, you know, turbo machinery application. So I, I knew I needed new capabilities and new um, numerical methods to, to tackle some of the things I wanted to do. Um, so, so that was really the starting point of, of doing this. And ever since the benefit of having your own code is that you can keep adding new future features that um, you, know, you can also develop. Um, you can test them and uh, fully integrate them into your overall um, framework. Uh, and that certainly helps the overall performance as well. And so in those early days, and I guess throughout, you're, you're seeing incremental increases in efficiency, accuracy? Oh, yeah. I mean, we, we've, we've not, not stopped trying to further optimize it. And, you know, you're kind of being forced as well by constantly changing architectures. I mean, it's great to see um, computing power, um, you know, still going up, but, but it is hard work as well to keep your code, um, you know, on, on top of things and, and make sure that you can actually exploit in your systems. And um, we, we took a pretty early plunge into the GPU world, um, but, you know, we haven't looked back because um, over time it's, it's really, you know, meant for us that we've been able to do things we, we could have not done without having those kind of architectures available to us now. Um, so, yeah, we, we are constantly working on the code and we participate in GPU hackathons and, you know, everything we can do to learn more about how to further optimize the code, we, we, we try to be involved in. Because that, 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 um, that, those outcomes are definitely worth the, the input. In Absolutely. I mean, it, it, it's enabling things uh, that, you know, we just couldn't do otherwise. I, I think the biggest challenge, though, for us is that, you know, it's very hard to get outright funding to develop your code. Um, and, you know, typically you get funding to deliver on some kind of physical problem and to produce some results. Um, so it's always a challenge to make sure that you, you have a little bit of manpower to keep working on the code. But um, yeah, I mean, it's something we have to manage. Right. Thank you, Richard. Chris. You're working in the oil and gas sector, specifically trying to understand how gas and water flow in coal seam gas wells. Can you talk us through how supercomputers aid you in your research? Uh, yes, so I guess I'd, I'd frame what we're doing um, by stating that uh, I think gas can be viewed as a transitional fuel as the world looks to continue its decarbonization. Um, and on that journey, Australia is currently the world's largest or, or second largest exporter of liquefied natural gas. So uh, between Western Australia and, and largely Queensland, big producers of gas. And here in Queensland, it comes from, uh, it's methane from coal seams that are deep underground. Um, and as large as the industry is 
here in Queensland, uh, there is probably an equivalently sized industry uh, currently trapped underground classified as contingent resources. So that's methane that is uh, in areas where it's currently not technically or economically feasible uh, to extract that product. So I think the last time I checked the numbers, the value of that unlocked uh, or untapped resource is about $300 billion. So uh, the, the, the drivers are certainly there for, for new techniques in order to exploit those, those resources. And so what we do is we use computation uh, to develop predictive models that allow us to test and interrogate uh, new techniques for reservoir stimulation. So uh, one of those is uh, hydraulic fracturing, but some of the others we look at are microparticle injection and also increased flow assurance in wells from the subsurface to the surface. So similarly to Richard, we do that using high fidelity computational simulations where in our case, we're coupling the fluid behavior uh, to the behavior of solids. And so the solids could take the form of, of an assemblage of particles. It could take uh, the form of a deformable brittle material such as coal or, or other rock, or it could be um, the casing and, and tubing inside a well. Our, our numerical methods are really focused around uh, the lattice Boltzmann method for fluid mechanics, which is, uh, I guess, uh, an outlier. I think in uh, not so much an outlier, but it's distinct to the to the uh, the more common approaches to CFD, which are around discretizing um, the Navier-Stokes equations. What we're actually doing is solving uh, a, a, a micro mechanical model for some approximated form of molecular transport that at the macro scale gives us a good representation of Navier-Stokes uh, fluid mechanics. Um, and the code we work on uh, for the lattice Boltzmann techniques is actually called TCLB. We've, we've collaborated with some researchers in Poland uh, to develop that open source code. And we couple to the finite element model for large scale problems. Uh, so on the order of tens to hundreds of meters in scale uh, and to the discrete element method for uh, problems on the order of micrometers to millimeters where we're looking at perhaps complex particle suspensions in fracture networks that are uh, deep underground. Uh, the key thing about what we're, we're doing is that we are trying to fully resolve as best as we can uh, the physics that we think is important to the problem that we're studying. So uh, in terms of the code and what it has uh, made available, so what we're really valuing is insights that were previously not possible. Um, these flow configurations or these flow situations occur deep underground. So on the order of a thousand meters underground where observations are impossible or very difficult. Um, and so the simulations hopefully tell us things that you can't learn from experiments because the experiments oversimplify uh, the problem at hand and you can't observe underground because of the difficulties with visualization or, or measurements and, and and transducers and whatnot. So um, a key part of that, uh, those insights, and in terms of dealing with large or high fidelity simulations is, is being able to interrogate the data set as it gets larger and larger. So we're using more and more refined grids and hopefully those refined grids are, are getting larger as well in a physical sense. Uh, and so just the outputting and interrogation of the results that you get from your simulation has become a really big challenge. And so that's where we've started looking at uh, in situ or intrusive techniques for data extraction on the fly while the simulation is running to be able to help us answer uh, the questions that we're looking at. The, the code is compiled on for CPUs or GPUs, uh, but more and more, particularly on the LBM side, we're leveraging um, what GPUs can offer in terms of performance, uh, particularly uh, the growing volume of RAM that exists on GPUs that exist in supercomputing facilities now because uh, one of the one of, I guess the limitations of the LVM is that it's memory bound so um, having access to a greater amount of RAM closer to the cores is very very helpful for us so yeah it would be a game changer wouldn't it uh, yes it, it, it is very very helpful and, and I guess in conjunction with uh, the very good efficiency we get from GPUs now, we're still able to leverage the associated nodal CPUs uh, by running, for example, the finite elements or the discrete elements on the cores 
that are on the node with the, the GPUs that are doing the bulk of the work. So if the load, uh, the proportion of load works out right, where the fluid mechanics is the bulk of the work, then we can task the four GPUs on that node to handle that. And then the, the CPUs that are there, otherwise idle, can, uh, can tinker away at the, the less demanding PEM or FEM calculations. All right. Thank you for that, Chris. Now, question for Basha. You've been doing CFD research in the past, and now you support CFD researchers running their simulations at POSI. I've got a multi-part question for you. Can you comment on the scalability aspect of CFD simulations, as well as the possibility of using computational devices, such as GPUs? And Chris, you spoke a little bit about that as well. Um, what about the application available at POSI to enable those new paradigms? Are the applications ready for GPU, CB, CPU hybrid systems and exascale? Or is there preparation? Yeah, thank you. Um, scalability is an important factor to be considered when, when you want to scale, do CFD simulation in a production scale. So in general, uh, so all CFD simulations can scale moderately or well on HPC. Uh, the reason for uh, such moderation is uh, there are two main two reasons. The one is the CFD codes which are uh, simulating nonlinear equations, which are uh, uh, what is a distributed type of stencil in, in algorithm. And also it, it makes it complicated in terms of demand decomposition. So there are two factors that really hinders the uh, code to scale linearly. Uh, when it comes to, uh, relatively speaking, when it comes to simulation of GPUs, uh, GPUs are, as, an, as a known fact, they are good at uh, high, because they are ha having high throughput. That in terms, uh, in a way, it reduces the um, uh, scalability or enhances scalability by reducing the latency. Uh, one of the important factors that uh, GPU provide is the in direct message copying between the uh, GPUs that in, in a way that will reduce the uh, message passing latency uh, when you compare to uh, message passing between the node to node or inter node uh, connections. Uh, certainly uh, uh, now the trend has shifted to GPU competition, competitions worldwide and there have been a lot of efforts around GPU. Uh, technology, not only compilers, not only devices, design of devices, but also on the software parts to make uh, users to effectively, uh, what do you say, put less efforts to to, en to enhance their code or to e increase efficiency using the GPU simulation. Uh, right now, possibly we have all possible uh, soft stacks like uh, from OpenACC to OpenMP software that provides the user to or design the code. And also there is a debugging uh, software, ARM debugging software that can user can use uh, to see the scalability on the HPC clusters. And of course, uh, we are still in that stage that, you know, uh, scalability is not just using multiple GPUs or multiple CPUs, but also depends on the physics of the problem itself. So you need to take, you need to make a uh, good judgment to which part of the code you, you have to simulate on CPUs and which part of the code that goes to the GPU. So I think in the near future, uh, everyone will, uh, will try to uh, shift to a uh, hybrid sort of, uh, hybrid, not hybrid, it's heterogeneous, heterogeneous simulation, wherein some part of the code will be simulated on CPU and some part it will be on the GPU, thereby reducing the uh, uh, latency and also increasing scalability at large. Excellent, thank you, Basha. So I think that that resonates with both Richard and Chris and what you were saying with the CPU, GPU, with the scalability. Does that? Yes, absolutely. I, I, I think, I mean, in principle, most of the work we try to put on the GPU because it is, you know, if, if we just need flops, the, the GPU will be better, but there's always things as Chris mentioned earlier you could do on the side on the CPU. Um, so certain post-processing tasks, et cetera, can, can be kind of um, run at the same time as the GPU is really crunching the numbers. Uh, I think another aspect maybe to mention is as well the communication, uh, MPI communication, which 
you know, for us used to be uh, not, not a big problem, um, but now that the GPUs have become incredibly fast, um, you know, all of a sudden your communication starts popping up as a, as a major uh, bottleneck. So, so you have to start also working on the algorithms to, to try and see whether you can somehow hide that um, communication, um, you know, asynchronous, uh, for example, operations, um, so that you can actually do communication while the GPUs are already busy with another task because they're just too fast <laughs> to, um, to, to kind of get a good balance. Um, so it, it does certainly involve more thinking around the algorithms as well and, and how to really exploit uh, more heterogeneous systems as well. Thank you, Richard. Chris, anything else to add? Oh, no, I, so I, I totally agree with that. And actually one of the, the postdocs working here with me in the group at the moment, um, he, he spent quite a bit of time looking at the issue of communication shielding in the coupling of uh, discrete element methods to, to the CFD. Um, because as Richard said, there's, there's, there's many ways that you can construct your algorithms and, and, and couple your codes together, but there is one way or a couple of ways that will hide most of that communication uh, overhead. Uh, and if you're not if you're not hiding most of that um, that communication, then your scalability will suffer very very quickly, as you look to expand beyond a handful of nodes, um, and you won't you won't be able to get the benefit of these ever expanding HPC centers if you, if you're not scaling. Absolutely, thank you. Let's move on to our second topic. CFD has come a long way since its inception in the '60s, with major leaps around new technologies and exponential growth in power from computers. And you've all been talking about that so far. However, the challenges the discipline face are the same, modeling accuracy versus computational costs and algorithm design. Again, repeating what you have just talked about. In 2013, the first simulation to break 1 million cores was reported at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in the US. As a result, they opened a call for researchers to access Sequoia, the then second fastest supercomputer in the world with 16.32 petaflops. This was achieved by a team of researchers working on a CFD code for simulating and testing noise from high performance jet aircraft. It's fair to say that the evolution of supercomputing is heavily driven by computational demands coming from fields like CFD. As we continue on the path to exascale, supercomputing technology continues to evolve, requiring changes in algorithms, computational techniques, and codes. So Chris, knowing the scale and technology of the system that'll be made available at PAUSE, what challenges are you and your research group facing now and in the future? And what does it take if we can dive into a little bit more about scaling your research area. Yeah, so I think as, as we look forward, one of, one of the big challenges we face is getting answers at meaningful length scales. And so um, I, to make that point, I'll just refer to the image that's behind me, which is uh, a Taylor bubble, a, a bubble of methane rising in an annulus that's filled with fluid. So uh, if, if I look at the screen from left to right, we've got some fluid flowing in this annulus and then right to left, we've got a, a bubble tra traveling in the opposite direction with the associated wake behind it. Um, this is a multi-phase simulation using a phase field approximation uh, formulated within the lattice Boltzmann method. And uh, the interface between the fluid and the gas is not uh, discrete. It is, um, it is a continuous uh, phase field that varies over the, a, a length scale of say a millimeter or, or less, depending on the resolution of your simulation. And so um, that needs to be captured, but the physical phenomena that we're really interested in occur at you know, the length scale of tens of meters, if not more. So concurrently capturing that very full fine detail uh, and then propagating it on a domain that's much, much larger than that, than that length scale is, is a really big challenge. So, so as computers continue to expand, uh, the challenge really becomes, okay, generating a really large data set, uh, but then interrogating it to get the answers that you need to assist decision makers in industry, right? Because, uh, well, for, for, for the bulk of our research, if, we, if we're not able to inform practice, uh, then we're not really achieving our objectives. So 
this is where I come back to that point on uh, intrusive or in situ visualization techniques uh, being very helpful. Uh, but even there, there is a there is a bit of a limitation where we, we don't really want to be making a priori decisions on where we focus our interrogation. Ideally, it would be nice to to look at a at a at a broad scale at the output of a simulation. Say, hey, there's something really interesting occurring over here. Can we drill down and and interrogate that area and visualize what we see there, uh, without knowing beforehand uh, where something interesting is going to happen. Um, so one of the other one of the other challenges I think is um, including the uncertainty of our simulations in the workflow. And so we deal with flows underground where we don't know what the boundary conditions are. We have some idea that there's a fracture in some fracture network, but we absolutely have no idea uh, what the details of its shape are. We don't know for sure what the properties of the fluid are because they change with temperature and they change with time due to the reaction of in situ saline fluids. And we don't even know what our initial configuration is because we're dealing with uh, uh, trillions of particles, if not more, that could enter a fracture system in any number of configurations. And so uh, the, the degree of uncertainty in what we're simulating is significant. And so we're, we're really starting to, to grapple with this challenge of how do we quantify that uncertainty? And if we can't narrow it down, how can we include it in the reporting of our results? So generate a stochastic set of outcomes rather than a deterministic uh, value that predicts one or two particular things. So GPUs actually really help in that regard because what they allow us to do uh, in conjunction with running lots, uh, well, large scale high fidelity simulations, what they also allow us to do is run a large volume of low fidelity simulations to help map out the parameter space of our problem. And so one of the things that one of the postdocs in the group is looking at is uh, uncertainty quantification via multi-level Monte Carlo, where uh, a handful of high fidelity simulations are augmented by thousands, if not tens of thousands of low fidelity computations of the same problem, uh, which allow us to generate, uh, I guess, robust statistical descriptions of, of what we see. So that's really where we're looking in terms of uh, the challenges we hope to tackle uh, with access to, to, to greater HPC resources. Thank you, Chris. And, and Richard, um, you've had access to exascale system, to pre-exascale systems, I should say. And are your challenges similar to what Chris is describing? Yeah, I think some of the some of the challenges are similar, uh, but maybe for us the, the range of spatial scales isn't as great. Um, so we, we don't have to consider you know very small scales in a in a well that spans hundreds of meters uh, or more. Um, I mean, still turbulence, of course, is a multi-scale problem, and if you want to resolve everything, you you have to cover a pretty wide range. So so that makes the problem very large in terms of the number of grid points you need and. But, but that's something that, you know, the bigger computers coming online is, is helping with. You can certainly make your, you distribute the number of points onto more GPUs or onto more cores or whatever you, you want to call them. Um, so it's something we can tackle and we can also increase complexity of the problems as we would like. So you know, one of our next projects, for example, is to actually say, well, we're going to um, stop using the assumption of all our blades being perfectly smooth um, and include some roughness, for example. Uh, that's going to make them much more expensive because we need finer grids to resolve all the um, scales of the roughness. Um, but I, I think, yeah, again, th those things can be tackled with the next generation of computers. I, I think what worries me more is the uh, the issue of, of the time scales. Um, so um, we, for example, if we want to simulate the, the blade to blade interaction that you know I, I have as a background behind me, uh, we, we've got a very slow motion of these blades, um, but all the turbulent scales, uh, they, they have to be resolved at, at very different scales. And also using an explicit code, uh, so explicit time integration means you need very small time sets to, to keep stability when you have your very fine grids, but you have to run for very, very long times. And um, the decomposition in time is not possible, like you kind of just use MPI to distribute your spatial domain into a, you know, a number of different chunks that can be put onto different GPUs. Um, you know, up to now, I haven't seen parallel in time algorithms, which would be nice to have, um, and certainly something to think about. But 
I think this is one of the big challenges. I think that you know bigger and bigger machines are not necessarily helping in that aspect um, because the wall time, you know, the, the time humans have to wait for the solution is not going to change by um, by just making the the, the, the machine bigger. Um, but it will enable us to obviously look at more complexity, uh, more realism in the uh, overall configuration of, of the uh, simulations. And I think other things, including more multi-physics, um, so including conjugate heat transfer effects, uh, including vibration of blades, all those things will be enabled by the next generation of uh, supercomputing. Great, thank you. Parallel in time algorithms, there we go. I, I think I've seen a paper at some point, but I, I just couldn't get my head around it. So if anybody, if anybody understands it and can explain it to me, then please, <laughs> please get in touch with me. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. That's a challenge being put out to the group. And actually, that's a, um, later we'll get into more about how to build community with the group. And perhaps that would be an excellent uh, topic of discussion for the community. All right, let's move on. So Ugo. You've played an important role in the procurement process that concluded with HPE being awarded with the provision of POSI's next HPC system, a hybrid GPU CPU system, 30 times more powerful and 10 times more energy efficient than its predecessors, Magnus and Galaxy. You've also been involved in procurements of the first GPU enabled supercomputers in the world. After listening to some of these challenges, and having the understand that you have of the POSI user base, how do you think the new system will help make CFD simulations better? And what, which technical aspects of the new systems will be crucial for the CFD domain? Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much, Anne, for the introduction. I will start uh, with a little bit of history here, right? So uh, the, first, uh, the first code we optimized when I was in Switzerland, right, for GPUs was actually a CFD code. It was used in the context of climate modeling, so different from what, uh, of course, uh, Richard and Chris are doing here, right? But we had to address things like uh, uh, solving, integrating Navier Stokes equations and running finite element methods and stuff like that, right? So, what happened at the time, we're talking about 2008, 2009 timeframe, right? What happened there is that after a couple of weeks, it was very clear that uh, the challenge was not porting the algorithm, to, the algorithm to CUDA to the GPU, but optimizing communication bottlenecks. That became clear immediately. So we did spend most of the time doing things like finding the right size for the buffers to transfer to, onto the GPU, which happened to be 128 megabytes, or things like uh, working on memory alignment problems or overlapping communication computation. And what that thing led to was the first uh, uh, proof of concept together with the NVIDIA and Mellanox of GPU Direct. This was 2009, right? So, uh, so what I'm saying here is they're trying to communicate here is that at the end of the day, you are always, when you are using accelerators, right, in a distributed environment, you are normally always limited by communication bottlenecks. That's really what, what, what's happening. In particular for disciplines like CF, so CF, CFDs, such a broad discipline and topic, right? Because it touches everything. A any any possible computational method is, is right there, right? From uh, uh, finite elements, finite uh, uh, volumes, uh, whatever, particles, uh, spectral methods, it's all there, right? So, but also common to all these different techniques that people use in CFD is, the, uh, is relying on discretization, domain decomposition, and uh, intense communication across nodes, right? So again, it's most of the time, it turns, everything turns into a communication problem, right? And so what we've tried to do, what we've tried to do with, you know, with the procurement of the system is actually, actually something very simple, is trying to minimize the latency, increase the bandwidth, and making everything more balanced, right? So ideally, you should be able to easily spread your computation onto a mix of CPUs and GPUs, almost seamlessly if you use techniques like open memory on GPUs, but that was really the goal, to minimize latency and address communication issues, right? This is really what, what we, have, we have tried to do here. Uh, one comment about what Chris said about uh, in situ uh, 
visualization, other things. What I believe scientists are looking for, right, in this domain is uh, interactive supercomputing, right? So the idea of being able to run a simulation, visualize the outcome of such simulation while the simulation is running, and then steer the computation as needed, right? Now, if we can minimize latencies and increase the band, when I say bandwidth, I mean bandwidth at all levels, IO, uh, CPU memory bandwidth, GPU memory bandwidth, um, fast communication between CPU and GPU across nodes and everything, right? So if we can minimize the latency there, then we are really going towards this interactive supercomputing concept, right? And that's really what we will be trying to do in the future. Last comment about uh, the amount of memory required on accelerators. It's pretty clear that when you have a very fast compute device, you need to have enough memory as close as possible to the compute units on the device to fit them properly, right? So on the new GPUs that we're about to acquire, there will be more memory on a single GPU than you have today on a Magnus node, right? This is one GPU, but then you have four of those. So we're trying to address that aspect as well. And we're gonna stop here. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Ugo. <clears throat> Chris, Richard, anything to say about any of that, including interactive supercomputing? Thoughts? Um, so I, I, so I, the idea of steering a simulation uh, is, is obviously very attractive. Um, and it is something that would be, uh, it would be great to see in the future. Um, on the issue of, on the, issue of uh, the integration of CPUs and GPUs, um, so what, one, of the, one of the challenges I think we, we need to address is, is how, we, how we pay for them, I guess. Um, in our experience, uh, the way CPUs are, well, the way supercomputers are evolving and, and the technologies are, uh, I guess, not uniform across various centers. Uh, what costs um, a certain amount here doesn't necessarily cost a certain amount over there in terms of service units. So I think uh, universal standardization of, of what um, uh, compute time costs would, be, would also be very helpful as well. Uh, actually, we're working exactly on that one problem these days with Maciej. Maciej is going to speak later, but indeed, we are working on that thing because, of course, you want, when you are acquiring resources right, at, at any supercomputing center in the world, you need to be able to map you know, CPU, score, CPU core com computer resources to GPU computer resources. Right? And, th and that's not just cores. It's also memories, everything. right? So yeah, I agree with that. I think we came up with you know, a few mathematical formulas to do that. That thing will be disclosed in the future in the context of the NC mass program. But yeah, we're working on that, absolutely. That's very important, yes. But does, does energy usage feature in, in that formula? Yes, uh -huh. yes, glad you asked. Yes, absolutely. So uh, I would like actually, Machi, I, I, don't, I don't think this was uh, scripted, right? But given where we're going with this, it would be good if Machi could say something about this thing because yes, he did, great work there and yes absolutely so we have been monitoring the usage of gpus at the center for quite some time uh, i was involved myself many years ago in an exercise to try to map a kind of uh, the flops per watt on gpus and, and cpus and comparing the, the outcome of this analysis and so yes absolutely we're factoring that thing in there are, it's it's very complex to do because you know as you might you can imagine right the gpu is so fast that it, if you don't do don't do things properly it will spend most of the time being idle right so you run a very fast computation then you have to send the data to another node to mpi gpu direct whatever but as you all know it takes longer to move the data than it takes to compute the 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 the, 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 the simulation step on the gpu right so that's that's where <laughs> We, we are trying to address the problem as well. But anyway, if, I don't know if Maciej can say something about this. I think he would be the right sure. person to imagine that. Sure, yeah. Um, so we, we started to look at this, uh, the, this issue actually already um, a few years ago when we, we started to, 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 uh, to get more GPU uh, infrastructure at POSI. Uh, one of the historical ways of doing things was to basically look at, if, if you look at service units and how you actually charge for CPUs and GPUs, 
was to, to look at the computational power you can get from those devices, right? So there was there were some attempts to, for instance, map uh, the a single or treat a single SM, um, so streaming multiprocessor within a GPU as a, as a single core. But if you look at the current devices, the number of uh, SMs in a GPU is is, is so large, and the the power the uh, computational power co uh, that that you can achieve on a GPU is 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 extreme. Not all the codes and not all the researchers can take advantage of, of it. So we think that actually a proper approach here is to look at the energy consumption. Uh, so that being a key to actually, um, uh, and also the base of, of, of the charging method will be, uh, will be um, um, using for the PSS. So the positive supercomputing system. Also having in mind that it, it needs to be simple and easy to understand uh, also to convert your CPU service units to GPU service units, uh, but the energy consumption of, of the actual simulation and uh, being a cost of the simulation will be the, the key to it. Thank you. And perhaps I should apologize to our panelists for going a bit off script, but the beauty of a panel is to uh, see where the discussion leads. Yes. All right, back on script to the third area. Uh, during our last virtual webinar, researchers in health, ast astronomy, and AI discussed the new era of research and their path to ex exascale computing. They talked about research becoming more data-driven, science shifting from experimentation to modeling, thanks to the accuracy provided by models, AI as a planning tool instead of an analysis tool, and more predictive medicine. Richard, what does your next generation of CFD research look like for you? What does Exascale mean for your research and what discoveries might it unlock? Yeah, so I, I think some of the points you just mentioned coming from these other areas are, are certainly going to feature for us as well. I, I, I see, well, next generation CFD research is certainly going to start replacing more experimental campaigns also in companies. I mean, I've, I've already had feedback from companies that are moving towards high fidelity simulation, um, replacing some of their high cost rigs. Um, so, you know, just, just um, if you think of the gas turbine sector doing experiments at, uh, you know, very high pressures, 50 bars or whatever, at 10,000 RPM and temperatures of, uh, you know, 1500 Celsius or something, it's, it's, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, and in fact, it's very expensive. Um, so the more you can do computationally, the better. And up to now, they've kind of not been convinced that the accuracy of the models they were using was good enough. But now that we are getting the high fidelity simulations actually into the regime of interest um, with the computing power we have, they, they are definitely looking at that. So I, I think we will see more CFD research um, actually being possibly even parametric sweeps um, using high fidelity simulations and, and reliable CFD, I guess, meaning that it's been validated to certain experimental rigs. And I'm not saying experiments will go away altogether. Um, you know, it's, there's going to be, a, I guess, a minimization of how often you have to go to a rig and, you know, how many prototypes you actually have to build. That, that's really what they want. They want to then simply verify that the CFD design actually delivers on, on its promise. Um, so I, I think that's that's in terms of exascale, basically enabling large sweeps of high fidelity simulations, you know, spanning the parameter um, space. I also think, obviously, I mentioned earlier, we, we can keep increasing realism, um, more complexity, more multi-physics, uh, all, all those things. And I, and I think the other thing is certainly an, a more integration of machine learning, data-driven methods with the CFD. Um, you know, that's going to be either for model development. Um, so again, helping industry to ultimately have more accurate design tools, um, but also for optimization problems, for example, if you want to look at a, a certain surface and you might want to texture it in a certain way, you know, what's the optimal texture, um, you might have to run, you know, an optimization uh, loop around the CFD and, and you, you might also exploit some kind of AI methods to then figure out how to actually find these optima. Um, so I, I think machine learning and, and data-driven methods is going to feature a lot more um, in, in the CFD context over the next, well, it's already starting, but I think with more and more computing power, it's, it's just going to become much more ubiquitous. All right, that's what I was going to ask. Um, so it, it's there, but it's, it's 
yeah, he is days. ushering it in. Yeah. Mm. All right, thank you. Uh, Chris, what breakthroughs do you think we'll see in the oil and gas sector enabled by CFD? Yeah, so I, so I think the first point I was going to make is very similar to what Richard just mentioned about um, using computation as a substitute for experimentation. Um, and so if we can imagine, if, if we think about this, this wellbore configuration that's behind me, we actually have uh, in the School of Chemical Engineering here an apparatus uh, in a building that replicates, I think it's about uh, six or seven meters of that vertical column. Now, that's obviously a small fraction of what exists in the real world. Uh, it's, it's difficult uh, to, to load it with gas. And then if we want to look at the effects of inclination, we're stuck because we can't just tilt it over five degrees or 10 degrees or, or 45 degrees. Um, and so validated CFD codes give you the opportunity to, to go on a campaign of numerical empiricism where whilst we're waiting for that future where high fidelity uh, large scale and reasonable runtime exists, uh, we can think about a world where we're using moderate scale but high fidelity simulations to do parameter sweeps that develop new empirical models that practitioners can use in the field as part of their day job. So one example would be what's the pressure drop in this column of gas and liquid uh, as you go from the coal seam up to the, the, the top of the water level. Um, so if we can generate simple models from uh, a background of extensive CFD uh, and do that without having to try and wrestle with an unwieldy apparatus, then uh, we're having a significant impact on, on the world of engineering. Um, thinking about new technologies that could be, so rather than just describing um, existing technologies and phenomena, but if we think about new technologies that we might be able to develop in the unconventional gas space, it would be um, around the idea of controlling the injection of novel microparticles in, into, into reservoirs to increase permeability and therefore gas flow. So imagine a particle that is receptive to an electromagnetic field um, uh, being controlled by some downhole instrument uh, to travel into places that it ordinarily would not go just because of the fluid transport. Um, and this is not a this is not a pie in the sky idea. This is something that is has been considered by oil and gas companies uh, around the world. But obviously, uh, the tools required to not only design such a system, but then predict how it would behave in a very complex subsurface geometry, um, need large scale computation and need the ability to explore a fairly broad parameter space. And I think. Largely, uh, the ability, I think I mentioned this already, but to inform decision making um, where we don't necessarily have time to wait for very large models to run. And so it's almost analogous to meteorology, um, but in reservoir simulation, uh, there is the ability to build very large reservoir simulators, but uh, oil and gas operators are making decisions on a daily, if not more frequent basis. So there's not time to wait seven days for the outcome of a run that explores only one set of parameters. Um, and so if we can shorten those run times and aid decision making with, um, with better information, then outcomes for, for asset management will only improve. That's an interesting, yeah, that's an interesting idea, isn't it? That feeds into that real time decision making. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Mache, what is POSI doing to get researchers ready for all of this? Thanks, Anne. Yeah, I think I think I will start by saying that the, you know, we all know that the evolution of supercomputing is, is, is driven by technology, but I would claim that this is a really ex extremely interesting time for supercomputing. And it's not only for me, not only in the context of the next next POSI supercomputer, but globally with, with various CPU and GPU architectures and storage solutions um, available, being available. Uh, we recognize at POSI that uh, the, the, the challenges that the, the new system will, will introduce in relation to, you know, to, the, to this technology change. 
uh, to the CPU to GPU transition um, uh, to the uh, AMD CPUs and GPUs and there are underlying um, programming models, the new storage solutions um, that will be installing new scratch file system and VME storage, long-term storage that will be available within the POSI capital, capital refresh. Uh, and this will also be a big cha change for, for all the Australian research community and POSI is, is preparing actually to, to, to lead this transition. As uh, we could learn today uh, from, from Chris and Richard, some of our researchers are already well ahead in that, in that journey, already prepared to utilize GPUs and scale and implement intra and internode parallelism. Um, and also implementing novel data analysis uh, and visualization techniques and preparing to include some, some, some of the machine learning techniques to, to steer their, uh, their large scale simulations. I think that for, um, we are also we are also aware that the transition um, might be a, a significant challenge for for actually majority of our users, and because of that, uh, we have started to implement and we are in the process of implementing of uh, many migration projects uh, related to each new component of the POSI Capital Refresh project. But especially for the POSI supercomputing uh, system, we want to make sure that uh, all the users and their computational workflows are are ready for for the transition before we decommission current systems, Magnus and Galaxy. Um, one of the things that I also like to mention and on such occasions is the POSI's expertise in supercomputing and scientific computing. Our team is based on uh, uh, specialists with research background in various uh, areas of science, which allows us to, to be part of the transition, working closely with researchers to understand uh, what those technology changes mean actually for, uh, for the research and how to optimize their simulations, data processing uh, workflows, and um, by the way, I think that this this is one of the one of the main focuses of this of this seminar is that that uh, we want to learn about the challenges for for various scientific domains and in the context of the next next generation super, supercomputer to also understand how we can take take part in that transition. Uh, we are also active in the field of building expertise in supercomputing in a global context. If you were following uh, some of the supercomputing news just, just recently, you might have seen uh, the recent announcement of the new uh, AMD MI100 GPU, which is a technology uh, predecessor of the, of the GPU that will be used for the POSI supercomputing center. Uh, system. Uh, POSI team played a, a crucial role, leading role in the preparation to that uh, product launch and the announcement itself. We have teamed up with HP and, and AMD and uh, were one of the first early adopters of that new platforms. One of the things that uh, we always mention when talking about AMD solutions that, 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 that were selected for our next system and what Hugo already mentioned is the the tight integration uh, between CPUs and GPUs uh, supported by the vendor and open source uh, solutions, tools and solutions from, from AMD. As one of the first teams uh, working on the MI100 GPUs, we were able to, to prepare to support various computational disciplines uh, and algorithms to use that technology. Um, one of the codes we are actually working on was, uh, was a CFD Lattice Boltzmann code, and that was the work led, led by, by Basha. Last but not least, um, uh, you have probably seen the, the recent announcement of PACER uh, program, which is a POSI center for extreme scale readiness. We are preparing to support a few projects uh, and co-fund joint PhD or, and, or postdoctoral positions working on optimizations of simulations as well as data processing challenges. PACER will be one of the, the main POSI's uptake activity for next, uh, next few years. We want researchers to think uh, and dream big uh, in the context of PACER. We want to team up with re um, research groups uh, to enable new scales of, of their science. The call cross is very soon, so uh, it's on the 29th of November. Have a look at our webpage and be ready to submit. Uh, last but not least, again, uh, there are more seminars coming. There are training sessions, migration sprints, hackathons. Watch that space and follow POSI. There was some discussion about using machine learning for some mm -hmm. kind of a parameter, uh, parameter sweeps and for the simulations you, you use. That might be probably a potential, uh, potential area, but yeah, just. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've seen machine learning used in multiple contexts. I mean, there are people that are trying to use neural network to predict the flow itself, um, but you know, quite, quite often that only works, obviously, if, um, 
flow resembles the, the data it was trained on, of course. I mean, all of these methods depend heavily on having access to a lot of data, uh, being trained properly, and then you can still only really interpolate between what you had initially. Um, if you want to do something different, if you have to you know, extrapolate in, in that sense, I would not be very confident of the predictive capability of these methods. And as we all know, uh, in fluid dynamics, very little things somewhere can have very large effects elsewhere. And um, how do you get a network to, to actually understand that for all possible situations? So yeah, it's... it's can I um, comment here? Yes, of course. Yeah, I had, I had a chance to look at the results in the paper, but the most showcase uh, simulations were simple cases like Darcy flow, but it was not tested against a very, a very challenging problem like in turbulence. So I, as I said, as Dr. Reza said, uh, the, one of the problem that is most challenging is turbulence. So in somewhere, uh, if down the line, we can, we can see some papers related to turbulence, then we can, have, we can be in a position to judge or to say something more on, on these lines. Thank you. All right, uh, we have another series of questions. Um, what is the operating system and architecture of the new supercomputer that's coming? What is the memory architecture and how is it designed to operate with the compute nodes? And how many nodes are in the supercomputer and how is the scheduler managed for the distribution of the work of the nodes? So all around uh, questions around what's coming. Um, so. And I can start answering the question and I, I will let uh, Marty finish because I don't remember, remember exactly how many, how many nodes were, were, will be on that system. So, so the system itself uh, is pretty standard architecture, right? So it's, it's, uh, we have nodes, CPU only nodes with two CPUs per node, AMD Milan architecture, 64 core per CPU, uh, DRAM for memory, so pretty standard architecture there, right? So what is different is only one thing, the interconnect. So between the, on the GPU nodes, between the CPU and the GPU, we're gonna have Infinity Fabric and the GPU themselves will be uh, AMD, MI, Instinct GPUs. We haven't disclosed the amount of memory that will be, will be available on the GPUs. It's gonna be more than for the 64 gigabyte per GPU. So more than what we have today on a single node of Magnus. So again, but the node itself, the architecture of the node itself is pretty standard. So it's a regular, regular AMD CPUs, uh, standard memory configuration. AMDs, you know, again, standard uh, AMD GPUs, standard GPUs there as well. So pretty standard. Again, what's different is Infinity Fabric across GPUs and between GPUs and the CPU and this link shot interconnect that connects the nodes, right? So until now on HPC systems, you had InfiniBand, OmniPath, or the Arias interconnect on the CRES systems. The new interconnect is, code name is, is Slingshot, is pretty much Ethernet based, right? It's, it's RDMA over Ethernet. At the software level, at the programming model level, we do not anticipate many changes there. So you'll be able to use the same tools and techniques you're using today. Ideally, communication should just be faster. That's pretty much it. But the, uh, last, last word about the IO, IO layer, Luster parallel for system with a very fast three petabyte flash storage cache. That's, uh, I guess, all, all, all we can say about the architecture. If there are specific questions about uh, you know, individual components, we can answer those, those as well, but uh, that, that's it. Okay, Maciej, and did you, there's a follow-on question, perhaps you can let, answer that one as well, Maciej. Okay, so I'll start uh, by, by saying that uh, we, we just had a, had a chat about this, those, those specific architecture questions uh, and, and, and thought that maybe that, that might be good for one of the AMA sessions. So ask me anything uh, sessions that we are organizing. Uh, the next one uh, being on the 7th of December. So if you if you want to have a, it's it's really an, an a really un, an informal, informal way of, of of discussing various things around what is happening at Posi and and about simulations and using our supercomputers. So if you're interested to have a like a, this informal chat, 
please please um, feel free to register for that session. Go to to, to policy uh, page to, to register. Uh, just to to answer some some of those more specific questions, when you looked at the announcements at the of the computer, we have announced that there will be more than two hundred thousand CPU cores. Uh, which um, for, for each node, it means that we'll have um, 128 cores in each node. So that gives you a, a doing, doing math, you can, you can derive with the number of actually compute nodes. We, we currently don't share the, 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 the actual number of nodes. We, we say that it will be more than 200,000 because it's, it, it's, it, it can still change a little bit. But then um, on, the, on the side of the GPUs, we'll have uh, more than 750 GPUs in, in the system. And the nodes architecture will be very, very similar to the node architecture of uh, some of the exascale, first exascale systems in US and also the, the systems that were just recently announced in Europe. So for instance, the Lumi system. So we are here talking about having a CPU with four AMD GPUs within a single node. Um, uh, that, are, that is actually also a slightly related to Pacer program, because I think one of the things that we were trying to, and the message that we are trying to, uh, to, to deliver with the Pacer program is that when you, uh, when you work um, to optimize your codes for, for, the, for, for the architecture that will be installed at POSI, you are also preparing your group and preparing your science to run on those, those first exascale systems, which, which is a nice, nice path that we see, and also uh, slightly changes POSI's Posey's role in that in that context and our support for for various researchers uh, at, at, at Posey. I think I was able to answer most of the most of the questions. Yeah, I believe there's questions. one more around the yeah. programming interface for uh, more detailed ones. Oh, yes, yes, programming interface a... for oh, AMD yeah, okay. GPUs. Yeah, sure. So our transition, I think um, Ugo already touch on that a little bit. So the techniques that you currently know for current um, commonly known GPUs, so NVIDIA GPUs, will be very similar to the ones that we'll be using on, uh, on our AMD platform. Uh, if, you, if you want to look at the actual transition of the codes, it's very similar also to what, uh, to what Oak Ridge National Labs um, announced uh, uh, more than a year ago uh, for all their researchers going from um, programming models like CUDA to programming model KIP, which is the AMD equivalent of CUDA. Uh, I'll come back to, to, to it in a, in a second. And moving from OpenACC, so the Pragma-based programming um, methods for GPUs to OpenMP, which is already supporting um, uh, GPUs for in, in the standard for, for, for a few years and is already available in compilers like GCC, for instance, also for NVIDIA GPUs, not only for AMD GPUs. So this, this sort of transition, however, we'll probably see some more support for OpenACC coming soon. Oak Ridge National Labs just recently uh, founded uh, Mentor, uh, um, uh, which, which is a part of, uh, part of Siemens to basically um, um, prog um, deliver the open ACC support within GCC and G4 Tran for both AMD and, and NVIDIA uh, architectures. Um, looking at the transition from CUDA to HIP, uh, we've been, um, we've had, a, um, uh, had an occasion to already work on, on that. We have started to, uh, to work with a couple of codes uh, to see how we can actually translate CUDA codes to, to HIP codes. It's very straightforward uh, pro uh, process. There is a one-to-one -one mapping between all CUDA and uh, HIP API calls. Uh, and there are actually automatic translators that you can use to transition codes. And it's not only for the codes that we have been using, but, but um, actually the, the, the cu currently um, the, the big packages, that, for instance, LAMPs or, or others that are already using GPUs, NVIDIA GPUs have been using NVIDIA GPUs for, for yes. some time or Gromex. Uh, those those transitions or porting those applications from NVIDIA to AMD platforms are organized within a few days sprints, basically, to first start your, uh, your process by automatic translation of the code and then working a little bit on the optimization. But it's really, really uh, straightforward. I think it's, it's more about, and that's what Ugo also mentioned, it's more about the transition between CPU and GPU if you're already on GPUs and your code is already prepared and restructured in a way that you can 
implement proper um, memory management between CPU memory and GPU memory, uh, you, you will be fine and you will be uh, able to transition to AMD uh, with, with uh, GPUs with no problem. All right, thank you, Maciej. And one final question as we're approaching the, the, um, the bottom of the hour. So if one is successful in an application, and I'm assuming this is the Pacer applications, uh, which year is the earliest year for usage? And then what is the cost that would need to be considered in the project? Yes, so those kind of questions, we have published uh, frequently asked questions on the Pacer uh, website. I think most of those are addressed there. Um, Plus and additional details, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I would probably just copy the, again the, the Pacer webpage uh, to, to the chat and please feel free to go there and look at those. And if you do have additional questions, as, as mentioned, there is an ask me anything for Posi. It's 10 a.m. on Monday mornings, open door, um, literally ask us anything. Uh, so come and join us. We have different application, uh, com supercomputing application specialists attending as well as others. Um, with that, what I'll do is I will now do a few closing remarks. First of all, a big thank you and a round of virtual applause to our panelists, Richard, Chris, Ugo, Mache, and Basha. A warm thank you to all of our guests tuning in from around the world and beyond, as well as Posi's marketing and communications team for coordinating and promoting this event. And finally, remember to complete the survey. We'll share more information about a shared community space. We would love to hear more from you about this. We want to keep this dialogue going. It, we want, um, yeah, we just, it's great discussion. There were open, open questions and open dialogue that I think um, we can take forward. So let's keep this dialogue going. We have um, preferences from the second poll that we'll be looking at and communicating back out to this group. Um, again, thank you for attending and happy Thanksgiving. <laughs>